Amen. Let's see your Bibles. Let's see your Bibles. Say word. Very good. Let's see your pens. Lesson plan. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 20, second book of the Bible. Exodus chapter 20. I want to welcome everybody watching online. Y'all in North County, we want to welcome all of you who are in the prison system watching as well. Welcome those people as well. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Exodus chapter 20. Exodus, second book of the Bible, chapter 20. When I was growing up, I went to Our Lady of Lords Catholic School in Malvern, New York. And I was... First grade hit the eighth grade. Wore a green suit, plaid, tie, penny loafers, no pennies, <laughs> yellow shirt with a little emblem right there. Every single day for eight years. And we were all one, all my brothers and sisters, I have two brothers and two sisters, we're all in one building. It was like a little, you know, two classes per grade all the way through. We had nuns and uh, priests for, most, for the most part, uh, teachers running everything. Probably one of the best things that happened to me. It taught me a lot of discipline, a lot of structure, fear of God. I learned to fear God at that place. Every time you went to church, Jesus was looking down on you. You know, had blood, and you know, it was, it was like, you know, it was, it was intimidating. And one of the things I remember the most was the Ten Commandments. I mean, we didn't really read the Bible. I don't remember reading the Bible holiday at all, but I remember the Ten Commandments. We went over them. They were on the wall. They were, you know, everywhere. And now, growing up, knowing there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. The question is, do the Ten Commandments still apply to our life? Uh, that's the Old Testament. That's the Old Testament law. How much of it applies to us and how are we supposed to apply it to our life? Uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much that you love us. Thank you for the word, God. Thank you for making it clear to us what you expect of us and from us. And we pray today you help us understand how to apply it to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we'll continue our series called The Royal. Everyone say The Royal. Royal. The Royal is a story about a young boy who was being groomed by an older man in seven different books to train him and groom him to take over his father's kingdom. We are the royal. We are being trained by the Holy Spirit as our teacher. And what we're going to look at over this series is seven different uh, literary styles of the Bible or genres. In music, you have rock, rap, R&B, country music. And in writing, you have different li writing styles. You have stories or novels, science fiction, poetry. The Bible's the same way. It has many different writing styles. What we're going to do over this series is look at seven of them. And each one of these writing styles has a different purpose in its equipping nature uh, to equip us to uh, live in our Father's kingdom and to rule in our Father's kingdom. The first uh, writing style we looked at was narratives, and we called that a book Warriors, stories of people in the Bible who are warriors of God. The second book that we're in now is called Loyalty. Everyone say loyalty. loyalty. And loyalty is about Old Testament law. The Old Testament law actually starts in Exodus 20 or 19, depending on how you look at it, where Moses takes, delivers 2 million Jews from Egypt. They go out of Egypt. Three months later, they're out Mount, Mount Sinai. Moses goes up on top of the Mount Sinai and gets the Ten Commandments. Say Ten Commandments. Ten commandments. How many commandments? Ten. Very good. And two million Jews are delivered from Egypt. How many, how many million Jews? Two. How many Jews? Two, two what? Two. Very good. Two million. They walk for three months. They get to Mount Sinai. How many months they walk? Three. Say it again. Three. And they went to Mount what? Sinai. Everyone do this with me. This is sinuses. You have sinuses, Sinai, okay. They go to Mount what? And God gives them how many commandments? Yeah. Very good. How many Jews got, came out of Egypt? Yeah. And they walked for how many months? Yeah. And then they got to Mount what? Yeah. And Moses gave them what? Yeah. Very good. So God, Moses gave them ten commandments. Now understand, Moses, they're going to get the ten commandments twice. They're going to get it at Mount Sinai. And then they're going to get it in the plains of Moab. This is Moabs, like Moabs. <laughs> so they got the ten commandments where? Mount what? And the plains of what? Moab. Right, the plains of Moab. Moabs. <laughs> the plains of Moab. Uh, and because in between Mount Sinai and the plains of Moab, they walked 40 years and everybody under the age of 20, uh, over the age of 20 died. So they had to give them to them again. And now I want you to remember, we talked last week, 
Old Testament law, you have to view not as rules, but as wedding vows. That two million Jews don't know who God is. They come out to the wilderness, and God introduces himself to them on Mount Sinai. And he says to them, here's who I am, and here are the rules and the, or the vows that we are going to keep, the covenant we are going to make with each other, like a man and his wife making a covenant. And so I'm going to give you these, these uh, guidelines and these laws, and they're going to have to do with your relationship with me, Jews and the God. They're going to have to do with your relationship with each other, Jews to Jews. And they're going to have to do with your relationship with Jews and pagans or Gentiles, non-Jew, people who don't obey God's laws. Okay, so this, this is what's happening. And so these, 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 uh, the law, the Old Testament law, are these wedding vows between God and his people. Now, we saw, talked last week that some of the laws apply to us in letter and in spirit. What that means is that they apply exactly how they're written in the Bible, and they apply in spirit. For example, my wife has laws for our house. These are not guidelines, they're not suggestions, they are laws. They come with penalization, <laughs> penalty, okay? And one of those laws is that you cannot wash your hands in the kitchen sink, okay? When you come in the house, don't go to the kitchen sink where the plates are, where you eat, and rub your grime all over. You got to go to the bathroom. That's a law, okay? Now, the letter of the law is that you can't wash your hands in the kitchen sink. can't turn the water on and do that with soap and have the stuff go down in the sink, okay? That's the letter of the law. The spirit of the law, remember the Old Testament, you have some, some laws you, you obey letter and spirit, and some laws you only obey the spirit. In this case, it's letter and spirit. You cannot wash your hands in the sink, and you shouldn't even come in the kitchen until you wash your hands. <laughs> Isn't that right, honey? <laughs> and when you come in the house, she stands there like this, guarding the kitchen. <laughs> and make sure you obey the spirit of the letter. Now, in the Old Testament, there are some laws where you obey just the spirit of the law. We're going to talk about that next week. Matter of fact, they don't apply to us as letter of the law. In other words, they, they, they would sacrifice animals. We don't need to do that. We'll talk about that next week and why. But there are some laws that you obey letter and spirit. Ten Commandments is one of those. We're going to look at those today. Now, there's ten commandments and there's a lot of information. We're not going to go over every commandment in, in, in length because we don't have enough time. But understand this. The only way you can obey the Ten Commandments the way Jesus and the New Testament tells us is if you have the Spirit of God. And the reason being is that you're going to see some of these commandments are very black and white. Thou shalt not murder. Okay? Jesus says, that's cool, but there's more to it than that. And the more to it part is going to require the Spirit of God in your life. Okay? So everything in the Old Testament, remember, is a foundation to the New Testament. It is there for a reason. There's nothing in the Old Testament that is meaningless to us. It's all God's Word. But it's not necessarily all direct commands to us. And so today we're going to look at what is what, what, the laws in the Old Testament law that you obey letter, exactly what it says, and spirit. So what we're going to do first, we're going to read through Exodus chapter 20 and get all the laws real quick and just read through them, get all the commandments. Okay, Exodus 20, verse 1. It says, The Lord spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. God always identifies himself. And then it says, You shall have no other gods before me. Everyone say, No other gods. No other gods. By the way, if anyone, if anyone ever says this is not God's word, you have to argue with all the times that God says this is his word. And all the times that God says, and the Bible says God spoke. Either God spoke or he didn't. And either this is true what he just said, that there's only one God, or there's not. It can't be both. So God is emphatically saying, I am the only God, and I wrote this book, and I spoke in this book. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, when you say uh, uh, you want to be tolerant, God is saying, I am the only one and don't worship anything else. Okay, you can call that, in, in today's language, that's being called politically incorrect. God is politically incorrect. Okay, I'm rolling with him. 
You shall not make yourself a carved image in any likeness or of anything in the heaven above or that is on earth beneath or that is in the water underneath. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Uh, parents, if you sin, especially if you sin in your family against your kids, it's going to trickle down to your grandkids and beyond. If you beat your wife, it's going to affect your kids. If you're an alcoholic, it's going to affect your kids. It goes on down. It's not just between you and, and you know, I'm doing, doing my thing. You're affecting the whole family and generations. Verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes the, the name, his name in vain. Woo! I, I don't say God's name in vain. Even from Catholic school, I learned that was one thing I probably remembered the most. And when I hear people take God's name in vain, I just go, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> and I just kind of ease away. Because I don't want no lightning bolt to be bouncing around and hitting me. <laughs> Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work. But on the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord. It is in it you shall do no work. You, your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your cattle, nor the stranger who is with you in your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. God didn't make the earth on seven days. Well, that, that's what God said. God said he did, so I believe him. Now, there's four commandments that have to do with our relationship with God and six commandments that have to do with our relationship with people. Ten. Four and six is ten. Four plus six is what? Ten. Very good. Four commandments have to do with your relationship with God and six commandments have to do with your relationship with man. The two greatest commandments, they asked Jesus in Matthew 27, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love God and love your neighbor. This tells you how. Okay? Verse, verse uh, 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long so they don't kill you when you dishonor them. Because <laughs> in the Old Testament, you curse your mother, you get killed. K-I-L-T, dead. D-E-D. -E <laughs> verse 13, you shall not murder. Verse 14, you shall come out and not commit adultery. Verse 15, you shall not steal. Verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Don't lie. And in verse 17, you shall not cover your neighbor's house, his, his, his wife, his female servant, his male servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Basically, I don't know how many of you have neighbors who have a donkey or an ox <laughs> or a servant, but they got something because it says anything else. Okay? Those are the Ten Commandments. What we're going to do really quick is we're going to go through just a few of these. We got ten fillings. We'll give you those. But what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to read uh, uh, the commandment again. We're going to respond, uh, re reflect on what it means to us. And then for your homework, everyone say homework. homework. For your homework, which is your daily devotional through the week, for the next seven days, we've given you seven devotionals. You're going to reread all of these and you're going to fill in how you are going to apply it to you. How you are going to apply it to you. Because remember, everything you read in the Bible has personal application. What does it mean to you in your life today where you live now? Okay, this was written a long time ago. But God's, God's word is eternal. His intent is eternal. The Holy Spirit will guide you. Okay, so all this stuff has relevance to you today. Okay, let's look at number one in your notes. Number one in your notes says, have no other God. Have no other God, that's the commandment. And the reflex says, give nothing else credit for your hope, the hope in your life. That means that when, you, when it says that you should have no other God, that means you should give nothing else credit for the hope and all the blessings that God gives you. Everything you have that's good, even the strength to get through the bad, is from God. And God is saying to you, do not give credit for what you have to anything else not even your hard work, because I'm the one who made you a hard worker. And I'm the one who gave you a job to work hard in. And there are a lot of people around this world who work way harder or more hard than all of us and make no money. They may, relatively speaking. We are blessed. And, and it's that no, no, no benefit to us. Now, did, did, did you do something? Yes. Did you apply intelligence, apply skill, apply? Yes, yes, yes. God gave you all that. 
It doesn't mean you shouldn't feel good that you did something well, but ultimately it came from God. And God is saying you should have no other God, no other supreme being that provides for you everything you have but me. That is not a suggestion by God. These are commandments. And so you say, well, I worship this and I worship that. God says, no, that's a sin. You should bow down and pray to nothing. Pray to no one. Nobody can do anything for you in heaven but God. Period. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Nobody else. No matter what you've been taught, it says right there. Next one. Uh, uh, next one. It says, make no idol. Make no idol. It says, you shall create no image to represent God. You shall create no physical image to represent God. Now turn to, you're in Exodus, turn all the way to the New Testament to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Now I have given you verses for each one of these points that you can look up later. And as you turn to Romans 1, it's the sixth book, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in the New Testament. When you look at all these Old Testament laws, what determines whether you apply it in letter and spirit is that if it is reinforced in the New Testament, that is how we know we need to apply it just like it's written. And in the New Testament, uh, Jesus and Paul reinforced the Ten Commandments. The rich young ruler said, Jesus, how do I go to heaven? And he started naming off the Ten Commandments. Paul talks about obeying the Ten Commandments. But there's also verses throughout the New Testament that, that build on the Ten Commandments principles as well. And we're going to look at some of those. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 18. It says, this is Paul, the Apostle Paul speaking. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. People suppress the truth of God. They don't want to talk about it. They pervert it. And then it says, because what may, be, what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. God has given you the ability to know him. He's given you the ability to, and the, the interest to, to consider him. There is no doubt to God that you have and I have the ability and interest about God. Even if you resist God, you are resisting something because you know it's there. If it's not there, you have nothing to resist. You don't resist it. I don't go around resisting aliens because I don't believe they're there. So what am I going to resist? Now, if people see stuff flying around, I don't know what that stuff is. It could be a demon. And if aliens come down, I'm going to be the first friend. How you doing? Don't eat me, okay? Don't say aliens are in the Bible here, so I don't believe it. Verse 20, here's, here's the key thing. For since the creation of the world, everyone say creation. creation. Everyone say creation. Apostle Paul says God created the heavens. God says God created the heavens and the earth. Who are we to say God's wrong? But that's on you. It says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. His love, his wisdom, his strength, his uh, intelligence, his creativity are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that people are without excuse. What God is saying, if you study the things I made, you will undoubtedly come away scratching your head saying, somebody had to make this. Or it is so complex and so organized, it is fascinating. Now some people will say, I wonder how it organized itself. God says, when you stand before me, I will not accept that as, an, as, as a viable excuse. I made it so complex so organized, so incredible that you have to admit there was a God. That's what he's saying here. Let's keep reading because that's not the point of this passage. It says, verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and foolish in their hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of an incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Basically what Paul's saying here is that God is infinite, and the evidence of him is overwhelming. And we are foolish to create a God in our own image of something that we create. 
whether it be an animal, whether it be a, a thing, a monument, a building, another person, he says, don't do that. Don't ever do that. Don't even try. Just know he is beyond what your mind can fathom. By faith we accept who he is. There is only one God, and you shall have no other gods, and make no image of God. Some of the images, of, some of your gods are, are, are represented in a green piece of paper. It looks the shape of a brick. It's called a dollar bill. That's your God. That's not a God. You can burn that bad boy up and be gone. Poof. That's not God. Your car is not your God. Your hair is not your God. Your teeth is not your God. God, the creator of the heaven and the earth, says, don't even try to imagine what I look like because it's beyond the capability and capacity of the brain I gave you. Look at number three in your notes. Number three, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Don't take the Lord's name in vain and basically don't use curse words. Taking the Lord's name in vain is one thing, and you can read later, but in your notes it says, Ephesians 4.29, it says, let no corrupt speech come out of your mouth. And only say things that build people up. So saying God's name in vain is one thing. Or, or avoiding saying God's name in vain is another thing. God said, Paul says, no, I'm going to take a step further. Not only do you not say his name in vain, I don't want you saying anything that's corrupt. The tongue is the most dangerous part of our body. Woo! We praise God one minute, we curse God another minute. The Bible calls it a fire that burns from hell. Can I get amen if you know what I'm talking about? Amen? amen. Woo! Paul said, watch your tongue. Watch it. And if you're a speaker doing stuff like me that talks all the time, ooh, watch out. Watch out. One sentence, everything, ooh, ruined. You want to be very careful. So not only do you not take the Lord's name in vain, you've got to be careful what everything you say or er, er thing. Er thing. Number four. Number four. Remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath, and what does that mean to us? Get some rest on a regular basis. Now, the, the, in the New Testament, the Sabbath went from Saturday to Sunday because Sunday was the day Jesus rose from the dead. So the church said, we're going we're gonna to gather on that day to remember Christ's resurrection. The reason we're here on Sunday is because this is the day Christ rose. So we are always celebrating that. It's part of the reason we're here is to celebrate that. But sa Sunday is not my Sabbath. I'm here from 7.30 to 1.30 or 2, and then I go home and I come back 4.30 to 9.30 or so. This is, not, this, is, this is my busiest day. Tomorrow is my Sabbath. What we don't want to do is get caught up, I have to worship this day. No, you don't worship days. You worship the opportunity and the, and the commandment to get some rest. That's what, you, that's what he's talking about. The Lord is Sabbath. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus says that the Sabbath was made to man, for man not man for the Sabbath. We don't worship the day. We worship the concept. We, we obey the concept of rest. Matter of fact, I want to read something to you about sleeping. How many of y'all love to sleep? That's a dumb, dumb question. How many of y'all are asleep right now? Okay. Does anybody here not like sleeping? You don't like sleeping? <laughs> wow. What's up, man? <laughs> well, for all the rest of us who love sleep, <laughs> you know, God, God, uh, sleep is a form of Sabbath. God says, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm make, to, I'm make you rest. And you know what happens when you sleep? Your whole body goes through a whole chemical uh, reorg and, and rejuvenation. I'm going to read some stuff to you about the, the benefits of sleep. Not that you need convincing. It lowers your risk of cancer. Reduces stress. It reduces swelling in your body, makes you more alert, helps your memory, reduces depression. Naps during the week make you smarter, improves your memory. Oh, I'm going to sleep today, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and it gives you opportunity for your body to be repaired. What God is saying here is don't get caught up in worshiping a day. I just want you to make sure you get your rest. And I want you to really, really rest. What does that mean for you? You have to ask God, God, what does rest mean for me? For some of you, you rest and don't do a whole lot anyway. <laughs> so it may not mean a whole lot. For me, I got I to I program stuff out of my life because I have so much stuff 
that I always want to do, I have to force myself to make space to rest. Everybody's different, okay? So you don't worship the day, you obey the concept and apply it according to the, the spirit in your life. But the Sabbath rest is absolutely something we have to obey. Number five, honor your mother and father. What does that mean to us? Respect your elders. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean your elders are always right because they are not. If you're taking notes, write down Colossians 3.20 and write down 1 Timothy 5, 1, 2, 3. Colossians 3.20 and 1 Timothy 5, 1, 2, 3. Colossians 3.20 says, children, obey your parents in all things. Those four commandments have to do with your relationship between you and God. There are six that have to do with your relationship with people. Now, I don't know why, but I'm going to guess we have more drama with people. We need more direction. Number six, uh, 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 commandment number six, you should not murder. You know what Jesus said? Turn to Matthew chapter 5, please. Four books right before where you're at, or five books before you're at, Matthew 5. Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, I think, six times. You heard it said before, but here's what I tell you. In other words, I am the authority. I'm going to tell you what it really meant. Look what it says in chapter 5, verse 20, 1. Verse 21. You have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be in danger of judgment. Referring to the Old Testament. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of counsel. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. I, I, I didn't kill him. Uh, Jesus says, now, you might not have killed him. But I'm looking at what's in your heart. Some of you all have hatred in your heart. As far as God is concerned, you're guilty. Here's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Holy Spirit, I hate that person. They did this, they did that, they did this. Can you help me? Yes. Yes, I can. Holy Spirit, please, please replace that anger with love and patience and forgiveness. That's a process, by the way. It takes time. But look at your heart. Your heart's intent is to do the right thing. If you ever, go, if you ever watch um, or know a lawyer, a trial lawyer, a trial lawyer when they go to court is not as much concerned with what they know and what the facts are because what's most important in court is what you can prove. You can have all the facts but end up being in your favor and end up losing the case. When it comes to our manipulation of life, we try to get away with stuff based on what we get caught doing. God says, I'm looking past what you get caught. I'm looking at your heart. Look at the next one in your notes. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit adultery. Uh, in your notes, you should write, do not lust. Whew. This one, ooh, 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 ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Matthew 5, verse 27. Look what Jesus says. You have heard that it said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. And that is true. We just read it in Exodus. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. If your right eye caused you to sin, pluck it out and cast it to the ground. For it is more profitable that one of your members perish and that your whole body be cast into hell. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Brothers be walking around with patches on their eyes. I'm just trying to be holy. I'm just trying to be holy. <laughs> Let's keep reading. Look what it says next. If your right hand calls you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. The same thing, for it's more profitable that your hand perish, but you be saved. Dudes, he walk around like this. How you doing? I, I'm just trying. I don't know what's going on, but. Uh... Now, do you literally pluck your eye out? No. It's called a hyperbole. Everyone say hyperbole which is an exaggeration. In other words, if your eye calls you to sin, do whatever you got to do. 
If you meet somebody, how you doing? Uh, I just, <laughs> I can't even shake your hand. I got to do the elbow because I don't have any hands anymore. They cut them off. I have a friend who has a sex addiction, and part of his therapy was he can't drive down certain streets because of the pornographic establishments on those streets. He physically cannot take his car down the street. That's his own rule. So that's what this is saying. Whatever you got to do. And what Jesus is saying is that, yeah, adultery is wrong, but it's even bigger than that. Adultery is wrong. Letter of the law. Bigger than that, spirit of the law. I never had sex with that woman. The reason that don't work. <laughs> and, 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 and let me clarify, I'm not only referring to him. Because that is just how we all roll. Speaking with, you know, telling half true. Well, he was telling a whole lie, but, you know, kind of wiggling through. Jesus is saying, there is a letter, but there's also a spirit. And that's, where, that's what Jesus, that's what the New Testament is talking about. The Bible, when Jesus says your righteousness must be beyond what the Pharisees do. The Pharisees would go by the, by the book, but their heart was dirty. Jesus is saying, you better go by the book and have your heart be cleansed, which is what we're going to talk about in a minute. Look at the next one. You shall not steal. Reflect means respect the property of other people. Oh, by the way, don't steal someone's reputation. Don't steal credit that belongs to somebody else. Don't steal ideas. Hmm. Don't steal someone's hairdo. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. What does that mean to us today? God, don't gossip as one of the things. Just keep in mind, whenever you pull somebody down, it is because you are down. Because you can't pull somebody down who's below you. At least in your own perception. So you pull them down so you can feel you better about yourself. What does that say about you? So the more you gossip, you need to look in your mirror and say, man, I got a problem. I'm gossiping so much because I feel that bad about myself. Because if you feel great about yourself and, and, and God's love for you and, and you're confident in God's love for you and his plan for your life, you're going you're to feel less, uh, no need to gossip. You're going to have a, more of a desire to bless people and encourage people and edify people. Versus pulling down. Insecure people gossip. People who have a bad image of themselves gossip. Who are not confident, they gossip. Because they're trying to, they're trying to lift themselves up at the expense of someone else. And by the way, don't listen to gossip. You should try this today. When someone gossips to you today, which it probably will happen, just either, just, there's a lot of things you can do. You can go, nah, 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 nah. Or you can say, you know what, I don't think we should be talking about that. And watch them go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we should talk about that. I don't think that honors God. Woo! <laughs> and they get huffy. I don't think your attitude honors God. <laughs> Last one. You should not covet. You should not covet. Turn to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, and the takeaway is that we need to appreciate what we have. Before I read this last point, I want to tell you that your homework, which is on in your lesson plan, is going to instruct you to go through all these Ten Commandments and write down how it is going to apply to your life. So when it says don't gossip, what does that mean to you? When it says don't lust, what does that mean to you? Is there somebody in your life you need to stay away from? Are you following me? Is there somebody in your life who's got something you're coveting that you need to stay away from? Or confess it or something. So that's your homework for the week. Again, these are laws, Old Testament laws, where you apply the letter and the spirit. Next week we're going to talk about applying Laws that we only apply the spirit of and why? Because it was fulfilled in the New Testament, not explained. 
Okay? But let's look at this last one. This talks about not coveting. Verse 21. Jesus said, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murder, theft, covetousness. All these things sound familiar? They're all in the Ten Commandments. Wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a man. Everything you and I do that's evil, that's prideful, that's wicked, that's lustful, that's egotistical, that's self-centered, murder, all the things we do, they come from our heart. And we saw last week the Old Testament law cannot save you because all the Old Testament law shows you is what to do and not to do, but it doesn't give you the means to do it. God said one day I'm going to write the law in your heart. And I'm going to give you a desire to do it. And I'm going to give you the power to do it. I used to use cocaine. I don't anymore. I used to smoke marijuana. I don't anymore. This is a tr true fact for my life, personally. I used to do all those things. I don't anymore. Why? Not because I decided to be a good person. But the Holy Spirit empowers me every day to do the right thing. And I still have a ways to go. We we'll always have a ways to go. What Jesus is saying here is that you can, do, you can want to do all this stuff, but it's from the heart that they come. Therefore, something has to go into the heart to change the heart. And that's the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why it says they come from the heart of man. We're all sinners. The Bible says that the penalty of sin is death. That's why we all die. But the Bible says that Jesus Christ, while we were sinners, died and rose from the dead for our sin. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord... And believe in the heart God raised him from the dead, we will be forgiven and filled with the Holy Spirit. And he will give us a new desire and a new power and ability to obey. Remember, letter of the law and spirit of the law. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers you to fulfill the spirit of the law. And so before we leave, I want to give you an opportunity because some of you may be at a point in your life where you need Christ in your life. You know the rules and you know the religion and you know stuff that you, you want to do right, but the Holy Spirit's not in you. You've never been forgiven. And God wants to live in your heart and give you a desire and an ability to do the right thing. And if you don't have Christ in your life, something's been plaguing you all your life, some form of sin. And God says, I can deliver you from it. I did smoke marijuana for eight years. And one day, stopped smoking marijuana. And one day, stopped doing cocaine. Stopped cursing. Got back with my girlfriend. We've been married 20, going, going to be 26 years in a couple months. God did, does that in your life. And God can do amazing things in your life if you let him. So let's all bow our heads and pray. And I want you to listen very carefully. Because God gives us very clear commands in his Old Testament on what we should do. But then in the New Testament, he says, I'm going to empower you. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, and he is going to empower you to do the right thing. He's going to give you a desire to do the right thing. The Bible calls it being born all over again, starting afresh. So right now, if you realize, you know what, I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus loves me, that he died for me, rose from the dead. And I want him to forgive me. Pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. It's a simple prayer of confession. But it's a prayer you must believe by faith to be true. In the privacy of your heart, pray, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know my sin is wrong. And I know the penalty is death. But I believe Jesus loves me, that he died and rose from the dead for my sin. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. Come live in my heart and be my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can obey you and follow you and do the things and be the person you want me to be. Thank you, God. As our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, 
In a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand if you prayed that prayer. Because if you prayed that prayer, you just said, Lord, I'm walking away from my old life. And I want a new life by faith. So right now, eyes closed, heads bowed. If you prayed that prayer and you're saying, Lord, forgive me of my sin, just stand to your feet and acknowledge his forgiveness in your life. Just stand to your feet and acknowledge. Thank you. God bless 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 you. We see you all over the room. God bless you. God wants to do incredible, supernatural work in your life. We see you in the balcony. We see you all over the room. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Anybody else? Stay standing. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. 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 We see you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Now we're going to do one more thing, and it's going to be important for all of us to work together. In a minute, I'm going to ask all those people who are standing to come down to the altar. Now, when you come, you can bring your family with you. But I'm going to ask everybody else, if before you start piling out, let these people come on down and get through the aisle so we don't lose them. If you're in the balcony, all you have to do is turn around and walk up, and the ushers will bring you down. So right now, if you're standing, come up out of your seat and come on down to the altar. Let's give them a hand as they come on down. Say, Jesus! Amen, amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Give me a hand. Come on, come on. Who's the man? Hey man, come on, come on, come on. Let's give a big hand, say Jesus. <laughs> Give a hand these people coming from upstairs. knows every single one of you and he has a plan for your life and he is not caught up in did you do this right did you do this right he's caught up in are you going to trust me are you going to trust me if you trust me everything will work itself out and when we mess up we go back Lord I trust you I'm going to obey you and I'm going to allow you to guide and direct my life because I know you have a plan better for me than me and he does God has a plan better for you than you and he wants to bless you more than you need you want to bless yourself and so I'm going to pray for you. We're going to lead you up this aisle. We're going to ask all of y'all if y'all can wait to leave before we get these people through. And I'm going to challenge all of y'all next week. We're going to be talking about the spirit of the law. Please do your homework. Go read through your devotional and go through the Ten Commandments and ask God how he wants to apply it to your life. If you obey God, you're blessed. It's as simple as that. If you obey God, you're blessed. Don't try to figure out how you're going to be blessed by doing this. Don't, don't waste your time. Because you'll never get it. God will bless you in ways that, have, that are way beyond your imagination for just doing the simplest things 
the way he says. You just need to obey him by faith and let him take care of the rest. Lord, we pray for all these people. We pray you bless them. We pray that you encourage them. And, Lord, we pray that we trust you and we do what we're supposed to do. And, Lord, I pray you show very vivid signs of blessing in people's lives out of, because of their obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to ask all y'all down here to take a right turn and walk this way.